accountant spends a week with the one he is going to replace and is being trained <coughs> by the one who is going away to give all the tidbits about the job that he was holding. And the last day of the training, the departing accountant tells him that he placed two envelopes in the dusk drop to be opened appropriate time. Like a American president leaves same way two envelopes in the oval of his drop and he tells the incoming president open at the appropriate time you will know that time so this guy told him that not to open that unless you have a crisis then you open that envelope, the first one. Then the second one, when you have another crisis, then you open the other envelope. So after three months, the new accountant had a major crisis in his job. And um, he was so afraid and scared that he will lose his job. So he remembered the guy who was going away, told him about that envelope. So he opened the drawer and found that envelope, opened it. It just said, blame me for everything, you'll be okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's what uh, President Obama is doing for the past seven years, eight years. He was blaming Bush all the time. I think Bush wouldn't have given that envelope to him. After some more time, he again had a difficult situation, unmanageable crisis at work. Again, he remembered, yeah, I got some more, one more envelope left, so I would rather go and see, open it, what it says. So he went and opened the draw, opened that uh, envelope. It simply says, write two envelopes now. Understand the joke? No. Hand it over to the next guy. To hand it over to the next guy who is coming. Because your time is up. This one, Second Chronicles 20, 14 to 17. It's all about King Jehoshaphat. Maybe you can pronounce it that way. Jehoshaphat. And there are very funny names which we cannot pronounce them. You can pronounce any way possible. It's okay. And uh, we all know that Hurricane Matthew uh, creating havoc in the states of Florida, Georgia, now North Carolina I think now is hitting. And they say 19 people died in America so far, and so many people displaced from their homes and facing hopeless conditions. We need to pray for them. So, what to do when we face such calamities, when they strike us in life? That's the thesis statement. What we do? When crisis hit us in our life, what would be our response? In the Bible school in Edinburgh, Scotland, a statement is hung on the dining room wall in Scotland. And it says, when God is going to do something wonderful, He chooses a difficulty. When He is going to do something very wonderful, he chooses impossibility. So, when sometimes we can't figure out what to do when things are beyond our control, 
Do we face such situations in life? I think we do. We did. Sometimes we are caught up in a situation where the things are beyond our control. We don't know what to do, how to respond to the crisis in life. It could be because of financial, emotional, physical, it could be anything. But they're bound to hit us one time or the other in our life. So what could be our response to that, those, those crisis situations in life. In such circumstances, we do not know what to do. I think I'm correct when I say that we do not know what to do. Our mind gets blank and we cannot respond with the same mind if some things happen like what happened to Jessica in the parking lot. So the immediate response is very, we don't know what to do immediately. So Jews under King Jehoshaphat were facing a crisis situation and they didn't know what to do. Neither King Joseph had knew what to do. So let me uh, share with you the context of this passage that we read. A crisis situation occurred in Judah under King Joseph. I qualify that statement in Judah. Few generations before Jehoshaphat, all the 12 tribes after being led by Joshua conquered the land and the land was divided amongst them, 12 tribes, some this side of Jordan, some that side of the Jordan, I already preached on that, sir, that sermon. So then that was called Kingdom of Israel. Today what we have in uh, Israel is one nation, Kingdom of Israel. You don't know when they came together? Which year? I pick your brain. Huh? 47, 48, we can take it. Well, after so many years of exile, they came together as a nation and established the uh, kingdom of Israel. So, but few generations before Jehoshaphat, things were all good for the 12 tribes. But the problem started with King, the famous King Solomon. He did build the temple, the beautiful first temple in Jerusalem city. And he was so faithful to God, the wisest man uh, during his time. And probably not today, maybe. Maybe he's, he was still the wisest as God said. Nobody was so wise than King Solomon. And in all his splendor, all his majesty and all that, he was not faithful to God. He married how many? 300 princes, 700 concubines. 700 wives, 300 concubines, 1,000. Maybe we can check that. But it's a thousand figure, I know that. So, and the, they were all not juicy married, so they're from the pagan culture, they brought their own uh, idolatry and their idol practices into Jews, the Jewish nation. And he was unfaithful. He was even worshipping other gods during his time. So God was 
angry. Then, uh, his, in, during his son's regime, the kingdom was split into two. The northern kingdom called Israel, the southern kingdom called Judah. Judah has Jerusalem as their capital city. So, King Jehoshaphat comes from <coughs> the southern kingdom and uh, he's a, he was a good king, a God-fearing good king who feared God and brought spiritual reforms in the southern kingdom. His father, Esau, was also a good king and he the, his son followed his footsteps. So, beginning of the chapter 20, we see that the King Jehoshaphat was facing an uphill task. So vast armies of Moabites, Ammonites were deployed to wage war against the Jews. So who are these guys? Do you have any idea who are these guys? That's right, how you might understand. You know Sodom and Gomorrah, where those cities were burnt by fire from heaven? Unfortunately, unfortunately, we saw that place when we went to Israel. On the way back from Masada, we were coming and the guide said, this is Sodom and Gomorrah place. We saw, that's just bad. Very close to Dead Sea. So, when Lot's wife, Lot and his two daughters were running away from the fire because Abraham requested God to spare anyone and God said, okay, there are only four people, I can spare them. So they were running away, the angel was, uh, angels were saying, just run, don't look back. And after some time, Lot's wife turns back and she becomes a pillar of salt. We know the story. It's a Sunday school story. And uh, then they went into the mountains. We know what he was talking about because we saw the mountains. Very close by. They ran into the mountains to protect themselves. So, unfortunately, the two daughters of Lot made him to drink wine and they bore children through their father. The two daughters gave birth to Moab and Ben Ami. So these these two guys became the fathers of Moabites and Ammonites. You know who Edomites are? Esau. Who is Esau? Don't give me the blank looks. Jacob's brother. Jacob's brother. Big brother. So Esau's generations were called Edomites. And they were almost to now, we can say, they're all and kingdom of Jordan today. So these guys were spared by God when, Pal when the Israelites uh, under Joshua's leadership we entered Palestine. God said, don't kill them. Spare them. Moabites, Ammonites and Edomites because of the connection to Abraham. God said, don't kill them. Leave them alone. And these guys now, they turn against and are coming to fight with uh, Jehoshaphat in the southern kingdom. So we read that in Numbers 20, 14 to 21, Deuteronomy 2, God told Israel to spare Moab, Ammon, and Aram. So those are the culprits and now these guys are trying to wage battle with the King Jehoshaphat, people of Judah. And they have vast armies, these guys. So it was uh, facing such a humongous 
<coughs> army was utterly outside of their control. So, King Josaphat was facing a crisis situation. King knew very well that he cannot deal, he could not deal with the situation on hand. Because he didn't have the power of his army to repel the enemy attack. So, Josaphat had a standing army that was no match for the oncoming enemy. So, first he did, the king proclaimed a fast throughout Judah. That's his first response to the crisis situation. So also, we can take a note of that when we are facing such crisis situation in life first we need to fast that's what King Joseph had did fast second he went to the temple of God at Jerusalem to pray first he fasted and all the people he directed them to fast and all of them went to temple to pray to God. So, I have uh, verses 5 through 11. We can see that I, I can read fast so that we don't have to, uh, you know, interpret anything. Then Joseph had stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in front of the new courtyard. And said, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are you are in your hand. No one can withstand you. See how Josephine is approaching God, holy and almighty God. You are our God, God of our ancestors. And you are mighty God. You are powerful. Our God did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it to give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend. See how Josaphat is capitalizing on these things. He is reminding God that they are his friends' children. Abraham was God's friend. Then they have lived in it and have built a sanctuary for your name, saying, this is your sanctuary we are standing. If calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before this temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in our distress. You will hear us and save us. See the confidence of King Josaphat before the Lord. So this is a kind of an object lesson for every Christian. When crisis hit us, remember King Josaphat, what he did. We can fast and we can pray to God. First worship the Lord. He's worshiping God with all the praises he could think of. How wonderful God is. How powerful God is. Everything is possible with God. Nothing is a surprise to the Lord God Almighty. Then he reminds, 10th verse, But now here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, that are the Edomites, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came from Egypt. So they turned away from them and did not destroy them. Think about it, God. We did not destroy them because you told them not to destroy them. Now see what is happening today. See, learn the words. How they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the position you gave us as an inheritance. They come back and hitting us to drive us out of our land. Then the twelfth words he says, Our God will you not judge them. For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Remember that. We do not know what to do, but 
but our eyes are on the Lord. Beautiful. King Joshua is trying to tell us this morning. So the King Joshua just admits that we don't know what to do. Sometimes we do the same thing. We don't know what to do when we face such situations in life. Then, 13th verse, all the men of Judah with their wives and children and little ones stood there before the Lord. Stood there before the Lord. They are humbling themselves before God Almighty. So also we can do fast. That means dedicate the day or immediately go into fast and stand before the Lord or kneel before the Lord and give Him glory. And seek his face. That's what the people are doing. Then my second verse is assurance from God. Then 14th verse is the one that tongue twisting word. So the spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel. I don't want to repeat all of that but he's a Levite. A descendant of Asa. Where did he come up? Asa. Where did you read? Where do we read the Asap? Is descendant of Asap. <laughs> you come across Asap in Psalms. Oh yeah. They are the Levites who are the musicians who sing in the temple with the psalms they recorded, they compose with the instruments. And he is one of the descendants of, particularly he mentioned Asa. So this guy is not a prophet. He's just a Levite, a priest. Not a priest in the temple, but just a singer, an ordinary guy. And he stood before the Lord because the Spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel. So, he delivers a message to the king. So what did he say? Do not be afraid or discouraged. So the 15th verse says, Listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Fear not. Do not be afraid. It's a common scriptural assurance from God. There are many, many times it is repeated throughout the scripture. Somebody counted and said that for each day there is a fear not in the Bible. That means 360 days, 66, including the leap year. And fear is the most common response of human beings in times of crisis. Right, Jessica? First you fear. You don't know what is going to happen. The fear. We understand that fear will never change anyone's circumstance. By fear we will never be able to conquer the enemy. Whatever may be that enemy is in our lives. Enemy, whatever enemy, whatever the enemy that is creating the crisis situation in life, we, by fearing that enemy, cannot do anything. Nothing happens. We will not be victorious over them. That's why God's first assurance is not to be afraid of the movement or of the situation. So God is reminding us this morning. Do not be afraid when you face such calamity in life or crisis situation in life. Just remember God. Because 
He says in Isaiah 41, 10, Fear not, I am with you. And again in another chapter, verse he says, Fear not, for I will help you. So, whenever a supernatural inter intersects the natural, there will be a natural fear in the person. When angels came to give, Gabriel came to Mary, she was afraid. When angels came to shepherds, they were scared to death. So the supernatural intersect the natural. We have that kind of a feeling. So in 12.7 it says, Don't be afraid, you're worth more than sparrows. This is who said this? In what context? Jesus says to the disciples, Do not worry about what you will reap or what you will uh, store. They take, if you seek the kingdom of God, you, you will add more. Maybe it's that context, but he says you are more worth more than sparrows, the Lord says to the people there. So fear can cripple us and makes us more vulnerable. So discouragement can be devastating effect on people. So in the midst of the crisis, do not be stressed out or troubled or concerned. But that will be a natural response, but we need to think about the abiding presence of God with us. The second point is, for the battle is not yours, but God's. So the Levites continue to say that the battle you're confronting is not yours, but it is God's. So God tells Joshua to tell Judah not to worry about the enemy, not to worry about the outcome, because God is in control. So when we submit to God in our crisis situation, trusting God completely, He wins the battles for us. How? I don't know, but He will. Sixteenth verse. That's what they did. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up the paths of Ziz. And you will find them at the end of Gorge in the desert of Jeruiah. So, you do what you have to do. So, but do not initiate the battle. But go to the front line. I will take care of you. Then the 17th verse. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your position, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. What a beautiful promise the Lord is giving them. So in verse 17, we observe four things here happen. Four things that can assure us, assures us, Assure us when we are facing crisis situations in life. The first one is, you will not have to fight this battle. You cannot fight with your own power. We are feeble people. We do not have that strength to fight our battles. So, let God fight for us. That's what Joseph, Joseph that uh, um, Jehaziel is telling. Okay, you don't fight the battle. Let God fight the battle. And he says, take up your position. So that means confront the enemy looking into enemy's eyes. So we may not see any enemy looking into our, our eyes, but we can look into the situation. Whatever may be that situation in life. Maybe it is financial, emotional, or something physical. Look into the situation, look into the crisis, and take up your position means stand for, stand still in the next one, stand for, face the enemy with confidence of the Lord. So that's what we need to do in our crisis situations. And then we see the deliverance of the Lord, and see the deliverance of the Lord will give you. So I know that. 
it seems quite ridiculous and absurd, absurd to most of our intellectual mind. Hey, that's not the way we fight battles. That, that's not the way we deal with our situations. We need to prepare for the situation in a worldly way. But a Christian prepares in a different way, like Joshaphat. So, the problem with most of us is that we forget that God can do the improbable and the unthinkable in our hopeless condition. God can do that in our situation. But we need to have confidence in God that he will do, he will fight for our, our battles. That's why God is saying right now to many of us, just wait and stand still in your crisis situation. Whatever may be the crisis situation we face in our lives, just stand still and wait for the Lord to win our battles. The reason some of us are still losing battles is because instead of waiting, we are fighting. Fighting on our own. Trying to see that we can get through this crisis. Because we are alone. We cannot fight alone. When God says, just come to me, I will take care of you. So God wants us to wait and see how he delivers from us from the battle. So one That's our problem. Many of us is that we refuse to stand still because we take things into our hands and cannot trust God completely. When you wait on Him, let God handle it. He has been God longer than you have been you. A preacher said that. God knows what is best. He knows what we need better then we know what we need. It's a beautiful quote. I wish you write down such quotes that can help you people. Today, we have seen King Joshua facing a situation where he does not know what to do. And Joshua very well knew that if they were ever going to be delivered, it is Lord God Almighty. That's why he went to the temple and prayed with all the people after fasting. Keep our eyes focused on Lord for our deliverance from whatever may be the impossible and hopeless situation we face. I do not know what we have, what we are going through in our life. But we can face God and give our burdens on him. We have our backs to the wall and desperate to find a way out of our circumstances. That happens to all Christians. We can do, we can wait, we can wander, we can wander, we can keep watch and keep worshipping, but still we don't know for sure what to do. But God is saying to us this morning, let me fight your battles. Can you trust me? Like Joseph had tried. So, in order for the Lord to fight our battles, we need for our battles. We need to do two things. First, to fast and pray as King Joshua did. Second, allow God to do our battles, trusting Him completely. Lastly, I want to give you this famous Psalms promise. Verse 6 10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Notice that it doesn't say, No God, but it says, Know that I am God. There's a big difference between no God, uh, between no God and I am God. So be still and know that I am God. All powerful, almighty God. That's what He is. My friends, we do get caught up in a situation where we do not know what to do. Then it becomes absolutely necessary for us to turn to God Almighty. And we should never attempt to do our battles alone. 
That's what this Satan wants us to do. To influence you to fight your battle so that you will lose the battle instead of winning the battle. It doesn't work that way if we are trying to do attempt to do our battles. So I leave this beautiful 17th verse once again. You will not have to fight this battle. Whatever may be in our life, in my life. Take you, your position. Stand firm. And see the Lord's deliverance will give you Judah and Jerusalem and you listening today. And this one, the second part is, do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow and the Lord be, will be with you. And what a great promise for those who are hurting Emotionally upset, financially down. Some people have no idea when the next meal is going to come to them. How they are going to take care of their needs. A lot of crisis in the life. In any country, anywhere, even in USA. But God says, do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. What a, such a wonderful promise the Lord gives to us. Go out to face them tomorrow with the assurance that God is giving. I will be with you. He says, Lord be, will be with you. Thank you. Let's stand for the closing. Father, we are grateful to you for this wonderful promise that has been recorded to us, Lord, in the Second Chronicle 20th chapter and 17th verse. Do not be afraid. Go out and face tomorrow because the Lord will be with us. What an assurance you are giving us this morning. Lord, whatever may be the crisis situation we are facing, help us not to attempt, Father, to fight these battles alone. We may take you, take you, Lord, with us our battles, to fight our battles. Thank you, Lord, for that wonderful prayers recorded to us this morning. As we go, go about our separate ways into the secular world for six more days of this week, coming week, keep us safe. Keep us protected. Put a edge around all our families. Watch over us, Lord. And continue to guide us in your ways. And if you tarry for the church, we may come back again to this church to worship you and to glorify you. Thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit, who is always with us, who is always strengthening us, who is always counseling us to take the right step in our lives. We ask this prayer in the matchless and most exalted name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit may rest and abide with each and every one of us here, with all of our loved ones, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Go in God's peace. Yes. 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 Yes.